Welcome to the SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home program. I'm Jazz Tanke, Senior Artisans Editor from Variety. Before we're joined by our guest today, I want to let you know that the SAG After Foundation is a nonprofit organization that relies entirely on donations to provide emergency assistance and free educational programs to SAG After artists. This conversation is made possible thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Over the past year, the foundation has given nearly $7 million in COVID relief to more than 7,000 performers. If you are a sag after artist and need help, please ask. And if you can help, please give. Information can be found in the description of this video. And thank you so much for your support. Now, without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce actor Robin De Jesus of Tick Tick Boom. Hi, Robin. What up? How you be, Jazz? Uh Hi, welcome. Oh my gosh, I am so excited for this conversation. So here's a fun fact. So years ago, you were actually seated in a dress rehearsal of Tick, Tick, Boom with Lin-Manuel Miranda and Leslie Odom Jr., right? Karen Oliva. Talk, I, yes, talk about that. Like, what do you remember? And when was it? It was the dress rehearsal. I was, I think, 31. So it was like six years ago. I remember we sat in like the first or second row of the balcony. Jared sat next to me, who's actually in the movie Tick, Tick, Boom, and was Lin-Manuel's assistant at the time. And I remember having never seen the show. I remember that I only knew the cast recording from like my high school years. I used to listen to it and all through my 20s. And I remember being 31, the show started and feeling attacked because 29 had been rough. 29 had been really oh rough. Gosh. 29 had been rough, but in like the way that is only rough to a person of privilege. You know what I mean? Like, just like full of self-judgment and what am I doing with my life? And, and, and so when I saw the show, I, I felt very seen by what I, what I was watching. And, and I remember the beauty of Karen Olivo having decided to leave the business, but then she came in to do this show and having this like, life imitating art situation watching her it was it was beautiful I did not think in my wildest dreams that it would lead to this now oh my gosh I mean you talked about Karen but how much did you relate to this character of Michael who you know was an actor and then he goes into advertising there's also the you know the scene in the movie where you talk about that but yeah it, it was I think it wasn't even necessarily that I felt like I connected with, at that point especially, I hadn't really connected with Michael yet, but, but the concept of leaving the business was something that I've danced with for a long time. And I have these moments every couple of years where I go, oh, okay, do I wanna re-sign this contract? Am I, still, am I still down with everything that I'm agreeing to when I decide to have acting be my career? Cause it's very different to have acting be my career as opposed to acting be something that I only do for love and that I don't need to have a career in film or theater in order to, to, to be successful. And with Michael, that's the thing is, I don't think he needed Broadway to be successful or at least not the Broadway that he was observing. And so I think for him, he saw the contract, it was time to renegotiate with being an actor and he didn't like the fine print. And he was like, peace, I'm gonna go be creative elsewhere. So I don't really think of his life as a, as a failure. I, I do think it's a success. And I guess in that sense, I understand that because I have had to navigate and negotiate in order to self-define my success within this business. Love that. Oh my gosh. Okay, so fast forward from seeing the dress rehearsal to you getting the part of Michael. Like, how did that happen? And you obviously have remained friends with Lin-Manuel Miranda over the years, so... What was that conversation? Sure. So it was an audition that my agent brought up to me. And, you know, I auditioned for Lynn over the years. We're really good as friends and creatives in, in, in like knowing how to navigate that and, and what role we're playing when we're with each other, knowing that it is, it is a bit of a, it, they overlap. But with this, heard about it from my agents, read the sides and thought, this is exactly what I've been looking for post Boys in the Band. This is something that will show that I have range and that can tether me in a completely different way and allow me to showcase maturity and, and nuance and subtlety, which I felt was going to allow me to actually 
finally play my age. But I also thought Lynn's going to cast some singer who wants to be a movie star. Like that's what Netflix is going to want, you know, and 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 there were folks who, who wanted that. But Lynn also saw my audition tape and responded to it. And, and, he, and he really he fought for me, which was really cool. But but at that initial audition, all I was really trying to do was you know, define my Michael. And the big thing with my Michael was I didn't want him to only present ad- as an advertising exec. I wanted him to be a full-bodied person who had been a member of Soho and the East Village and was an artist and was friends with Jonathan. So I wanted to make sure in my audition that I presented Michael not as the worker, but as the person that sits down in the couch and watches Sunday in the Park with, sorry, <laughs> and watches Sunday in the Park with George, with Jonathan. And apparently that was what Lynn and Andrew responded to because everyone else was coming in all pulled up. Lynn did see me a week after my, he got my, my audition on film and we were at a party. He had a drink in him and he goes, oh my God, your audition was so effing good. I can't wait for you to be in this movie. And my eyes just went massive and he realized, oh, um, uh, let me walk this back. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's going to be as Michael, but it's going to be in some capacity. You're going to be in the movie. Uh, we'll figure it out. And then it was because I hadn't had my chemistry <laughs> read with Andrew. And, and, I, and I'll skip ahead. When I left the chemistry read, I didn't know. I wasn't feeling particularly intuitive as to what the result was going to be. But then Andrew came over and gave me DAP. And I knew when he said goodbye to me in that way that there was something in the air. And so I, I, I figured some good news might come my way. And it did after going to a wedding in White Plains, the town that Jonathan and Michael are both from. I drove a half hour to, uh, uh, from White Plains after my friend's wedding there. And Lynn FaceTimed me to let me know that he was offering me the part. So I, I think Jonathan was also like, yo, I'm going to give you this opportunity right after you're in my hometown, boy. Oh, my gosh. It was written. It's been written in the stars. It's been out there. Um, You know, you talk about making Michael, you know, just fleshing him out as a person as opposed to just this, you know, ad ad exec. Talk about the research and prep that you did to play. Yeah. So I will say I did not meet real life Michael beforehand. I think I was in a particularly um, self-conscious place in figuring out Michael. And I I realized post that I think at that time I was in such a sensitive place that if I had met Matt, Matt uh, O'Grady, who is real life Michael and is still with us to this day, is healthy, successful, creative in the arts community. And, and, and so I, because I knew that much about him, I, I still got something out of it but I didn't want to meet him out of fear. And, and I think it was fear of disappointing him maybe. And so that was a part of my process early on was working through that, you know, thinking about the nineties and what it was like to be an HIV positive Latino in that time period, thinking about where am I going to get my energy on the days where I might not be feeling it. And so there, there's a lot of table work and that's what I was actually going to answer reply with, but I'm going to skip that because I think there's something else coming through now, which is, you know, obviously I went through the scenes, I learned the songs, we we worked our tails off doing choreography, but there was a spiritual element that I really wanted to focus on. And there was a calling in of Jonathan and his spirit. And And I really do believe that good art is just a reflection of divinity. And so I just got to do what I got to do to be present and, 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 and there in that scene. And what was really cool was that I feel like I've been able to insert my Latino ancestors who were deleted from HIV stories and I got to put them back where they belong because I never got to meet my elders. I didn't, I didn't get to meet them physically because of the AIDS epidemic and I didn't even get to meet them in narrative form because it was kind of colonized. Yeah. Oh so my I gosh! Well, go in there and just like be like, y'all, y'all belong here. What was that like? You know, jumping off of that to give Michael the Latina the representation of this movie to audiences and hearing people say that they feel seen. 
I mean, the thing that sticks out to me when you say that is like accumulation, inheritance, and who has access to things. Because you look at this year and you see West Side Story coming out, Tick, Tick, Boom coming out, and In the Heights coming out, and many other musicals. But I say those three specifically because Oscar Hammerstein was a mentor to Stephen Sondheim. Stephen Sondheim was a mentor to Jonathan Larson. And Jonathan Larson was a mentor, even though they didn't meet, to Lynn manuel He gave Lynn permission to write In the Heights. So it's not a coincidence in the same year we're getting In the Heights, Tick, Tick, and West Side Story, and that Tick, Tick references that, right? Now, up until Lynn, that lineage was white predominantly and male. And there's something so beautiful. And with Lynn, it still is male. And I, and I hope that we get many more female writers in, in in these positions of power as well, with me, with musicals especially too. But Lynn as a Latino man now has the platform to help this brother out. Because I've been here 20 years auditioning and not really getting the, the footing that I felt that I could deliver, You if that makes sense. I don't know if that wording is, is correct, but there have been what? job opportunities where I thought, man, I could do that, but I don't have the accessibility to that. I'm not getting in that room to prove it. And Lynn now in his inheritance going here, Robin, this is the meal that you've been waiting for and I want you to eat. And, and that's the coolest thing of it all is just being able, to, being able to clock that and being able to also clock that we're in this really cool moment where everyone, when it comes to conversations about diversity, we're kind of like, we're in the middle of like social justice fatigue, but watching Lynn and watching the year also gives me the perspective of, Whoa, like, yes, things are heavy. Yes, things are rough. But how lucky, how fortunate that we get to be a part of this moment that is in search of healing, that we get to contribute to this collective consciousness that is for the betterment of, of all of us. And I, I know in my, in my core that Tick Tick is a part of that. And I'm just happy that it exists in a way that is now inherited onward. And it's a global audience because it's on Netflix around the world, not just in America. Um, you talk about working with Lynn. It is crazy when you watch this film and you're like, this is his directorial debut. <laughs> this is like his <laughs> first film. What was it like working with him as a director and being a part of this history? It was great. It was it was great. And I, and I think ultimately ended up being really healing for me because Lynn, as my friend and, and as such a great leader and as someone who centers joy and fun while at work and, and getting the work done while being in that great environment, um, I think it allowed me to really like gain a new perspective. Uh, in general, Lynn, I'm I'm always amazed that I keep being amazed by him and all of his brilliance. Cause I look at my friend and I know he's a genius. Then I work with him as a director. I'm like, whoa, like I didn't even know that like there's another room in the house I didn't know existed, right? But then also for me, early on in, in the filmmaking process, I was having these, these panic attacks, these mini panic attacks. And, and I, the thing is, it was because my creativity was in conflict with my ego and I'm like working through all this young actor -y stuff and like just trying to do good work. But I would look at Lynn and he never confirmed or affirmed any of my insecurities. I'd look at Lynn and I knew that if I was having a particularly down moment, when I look at the energy and the spirit that he centers and its infectiousness, I know that whatever I'm bringing in is probably not of service and not, there's no real place for it there. So there's something about it that just, his presence allows you to just get back to the work because he's just living, living. So yeah. how, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that makes makes sense. It's, and I will also say that there's a level of comfort he gives me in being able to just speak Spanglish on set in just talking the way we talk. And like his direction to me felt like being on the couch as cheesy as it sounds. And, and it just allowed me to get in there and do what I need to do and get the work done. Oh my gosh. I love that. Okay. You mentioned choreography, talk about the core, you know, prepping and chore the choreography for no more. And that number, you know, you're running up and down the stairs or actually, yeah. Talk about yeah. shooting so, that number. 
Yeah, yo, kudos to Ryan Heffington, our choreographer, who's so wonderful. And we spent months on that choreography, especially because of the shutdown. We rehearsed for three months and we started shooting. We got two weeks. We got shut down, closed for six months. We rehearsed a couple months and shot for a couple more. We we had a moment to really like marinate on the choreography and relearn it. And it was so hard. <laughs> and I'm, I'm saying this as someone who comes from Broadway, it was so hard because from the technical aspect, what we were trying to achieve in my number was this sm- slow motion special effect where the choreography was in slow motion, but the words that were coming out of our mouths were in real time. And the only way to achieve that was to do everything like four times the speed. So now we're rehearsing how to dance, act, and lip sync at this speed. It, for choreography that's intended to be exciting in slow-mo, you're not having to do that choreography like at that crazy speed. So it was it was kind of a great way for me and Andrew to just like get in there and get scrappy and really learn each other. And ultimately it ended up being one of the funnest days on set, specifically that that last segment at the end of the number where we're in the, the lobby of my building. I think we shot that like 21 times and only two takes were good. <laughs> we're like, but like, or were usable, but like we got those two in and, and to get those two, we, we, we just, we just had the, the best time. Oh my gosh. You mentioned the pandemic. I mean, what was that like for you just as an actor where, you know, you prep for a role, you start, and then, you know, we have this, mo- this thing where you, you know, you're no longer able to be in this character because there's no productions. And then to go back to him, you know, what, six months later, talk about how challenging that was. Well, I'll give you I'll give you one little story that I feel like will give you an idea in, in, in many ways. Like it was good for certain things because because certain aspects of the character got to marinate even more. And like, really, I got to figure out more stuff. But I remember specifically the, the first dialogue scene I shot was the scene in the office, the status reveal to Jonathan. And on that day, we had we had rehearsed the scene a certain way, but something was coming, downloading for me that day that just felt really different. And so, and I listened to it, but I knew the only way that that, what I ended up doing that day in, in, in the scene would, would work is if the scene on the street, the argument with Jonathan played a certain way. So it gave me like seven, eight months to just obsess over that scene and like think about what would happen if it did not go exactly as I wanted it to and everything would fall apart. Just like catastrophizing, you know? And what was really cool was that in actuality, when we came back, I had found this new perspective of, I clocked as cheesy as it sounds that like in those mini panic attacks I'd been having, I'd been choosing fear over love, over my love of performing. And and so by the time we got to the scene on the street with Andrew, that work had sort of settled and that I had been able to quiet my ego in a way that I hadn't felt in a long time. And so that scene on the street I remember that day thinking, oh, there's a divine presence on this street right now because I feel magic happening. And I looked at Andrew and he felt the same way. We didn't say anything, but we, we felt the, you know, the hair standing up. And I don't, I don't know that that would have happened without the, the shutdown. I don't know that that would have happened without me taking the time to ask myself questions and questioning where I was spiritually and, um, and just continuing healing because we, we never stop. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, you know, you mentioned Andrew, it is such a beautiful chemistry friendship that you see on screen. Did you get to hang out much together? Like talk about. Yeah. That's the cool thing about doing a musical. When you do a musical, you, you have, you oh, re- rehearsing is unavoidable. You know, it's, it's, it's part of it. And, and I think that those rehearsals and being able to watch each other, how we learn, because as an actor, oftentimes like memorization is something you do on your own. So no one really knows your process. But when you're learning choreography, you're very vulnerable. And I'm, a, I'm not someone who's a dancer first by any means. And Andrew's someone who, who isn't a dancer. And so it's vulnerable. We're, we're learning each other. But that also allowed us to just have our guards down. 
And that allowed us, and also just dancing, touching each other and, and the, the waltzing and everything, you're in each other's personal space. And I think what came from that actually was we were able to showcase intimacy between two men in a non-romantic way. Two men, one of whom happened to be gay and one of whom happened to be straight. And this really cool thing happened afterwards where we thought, oh, no one's ever really modeled that for kids before. And so that's probably one of the things that I'm most proud of within the film, but also working with Andrews, like, I felt like I unlocked something in many ways because I'm coming in as someone who's, who I feel like I'm in my come up and I feel like I'm looking at these celebrities and thinking, well, what do they do differently? What, what is it about their acting? What, what, what is that it factor? And, you know, I clock that it's working your tail off. <laughs> it's like working really hard. And, <laughs> And I do that already. So I just got to keep doing what I'm doing, you know, and the rest will align. Um, and then I guess the last thing I'll say is, you know, working with Andrew was also really, really great because so not, it's not always that you get to work with someone else who's a mystic in many ways. And so it was really cool as a believer in other, in, in divinity and, and, and divinity showing up in, in my creativity, it was so nice to share that with him. It was so nice to be able to look him in the eye and know that he felt what I felt, but we're not gonna name it because all we wanna do is just stay in it. It was, it was um, it's corny, but it's, it's like, it's spiritual and religious. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Sondheim and obviously it, there's so many beautiful tributes to him in the film Sunday of course which we will talk about but let's talk about the voicemail you know Lynn mentioned he had you know Sondheim actually re-recorded that um what did Sondheim mean to you and what was that like hearing his voice especially after his passing like what did that mean to you well I mean Sondheim is like he's like the elder that everyone looked up to you know, he's, he's like, he's like the head person in the village, you know, when you, when you're, when you're a theater lover and, and growing up, I remember there were certain shows of Sondheim that I immediately clicked with like into the woods, but then there's something like, like uh, Sunday in the park with George, where the first time I didn't get it, but something told me to watch it again. And, and, and I found that so interesting that his work, I might not initially like it, but I knew that it required a second viewing. And when I watched the second and third time, I became obsessed with Sunday. It's one of my top shows and has top five shows and it has been since high school. And there's something about that man and his brilliance and his lyrics that it's just always entertaining. It's you're always, he writes in a way that is so incredibly stimulating and you think it'd be difficult to keep up, but it's quite the opposite because he just keeps you on your toes. My first film ever was camp and Sondheim made a cameo in it. And so it's like really weird now to have this, because in, in some strange way, Tick Tick feels like another kind of debut for me in my career. And so the fact that he shows up, showed up again, kind of makes me feel like it's a bit of a Puerto Rican Latinos, we say tiene un, tiene un don, like it's blessed, it's anointed, you know? And that last voicemail was originally Bradley Whitford saying it. And Sondheim himself was the one who asked Lynn if he could re-record it because he didn't like the words. And Lynn said, well, that was what you said. And he was like, no, no, I want to do something else. And he just sent a voice note and Lynn used it and put it in. And I can't help but think that it's just like this, this blessing that we got, this last little message to be proud. Ooh, mm, 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 mm. It's yeah, such a gift. It is yeah. such, yeah. Um, were you on set for Sunday when that was being recorded? I wasn't there the day that Bernadette was there, and that <laughs> that I didn't, I didn't. I was there, but I didn't report to set. I I didn't know that I could just go. Lynn was like, "Yeah, dude, like I got space for you. Don't worry." So by the time I was able to to watch that day later on, I'm very happy to say that I got to watch Mr. Andre Shields, Mr. Chuck Cooper, Howard McGillen, and the always beautiful, um, uh, I, I don't even want to say beautiful because it almost sounds condescending, but this like, ever powerful Felicia Rashad. And that was so cool to just have my chair kind of be like two chairs over from her and just like 
watch her prep and, and have this moment. And then all the work that went into creating that moment, Lynn could never shoot more than like two or three people in one take. And so everyone, everyone quarantined to, to various degrees and, and the people that really, really couldn't quarantine at all, they had to be shot separate individually. So Lynn then had to take six different shots and, and layer them in. Um, but watching it, watching it specifically with a Broadway audience, which I got to do as well, was so cool because everyone went back to being a child. There was the, 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 that breath that Andrew takes right before the first Sunday when the silhouette forms. At that Broadway screening, when he took a breath, the audience immediately inhaled with him. And then when they heard the first, the S from Sunday, they all went, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it was like a primal sigh slash moan because that's what Sondheim does for us. Like he, he is like puberty. He's like the first time that the joy of, of, of like theater that, that you feel it in a different level and intensity. And so he always, he has this special place and what he unlocks in us is, is like that true theater geek nerdum fan which is what that moment's all about with sunday it, it was such a moment at the afi premiere like the the applauding for every cameo was insane so, and like you said it was like being a kid again um you know you've talked about theater and what is the how is it different you know performing for a role on broadway or on stage like eight times a week versus you know, playing something like Michael, like what is that process like or how does it differ? Yeah, so, I mean, I actually am someone who, I feel like my process isn't really that, that different for film and, and for stage. I actually feel like for a long time as a theater actor, people would always say, oh, if you're a theater actor, like you're, you know, you have a tendency to go too big. And I felt like for years on camera, I would actually go too small because I was, I was correcting so much that I would go too far. And, and so now I've found that I, I don't know, I, I feel it, whatever the thing is, I, I, I feel it. What, what, what is incredibly different though, is the editing process. On stage, we're in that wide shot the whole time. So I have more, more control over my, my performance and I'm able to sustain relationships with multiple characters at once because the audience can just see more. Whereas on camera, I may have a moment with another character but if the camera's not on both of us, then no one's going to even know that that existed. So, so the big difference is ends up being just like, let me word this better. It just ends up being editing. It just ends up being that I have to give up control and that then someone else gets to define your thing. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Um, what would, so years ago you were in rent and here we are as you've said you know you've kind of gone full circle especially with the Jonathan Larson angel um looking over you what would the Robin of 20 years ago think of your journey and how far you have come there's there's a part of Robin that would say yeah duh <laughs> you know because that's that's the part of me that that gave me the courage to just know that I have a right to pursue this, that, you know, there has to be a part of you that knows that you're talented, that knows you're gifted and that you have that right. And, and it was already seeing this moment happen. But then there's another part of me that would just be so blown away that I get to, um, you know, being the child of Puerto Rican migrant workers who work in factories and who didn't have the luxury of finishing high school. And to know that in one generation, I'm number two on the call sheet of a Netflix film being directed by Lin-Manuel starring Andrew Garfield, like that does take my breath away at, at, at times. And I think what I, what I would wanna specifically say to my younger self is keep being you because so many of the things that are naturally me in my late twenties, I lost along the way. And they were the things that actually really, really preserved me. And in my thirties, I've, I've relearned certain habits and, and, and 
I now partake in rituals that I did very naturally when I was younger. And uh, so I, I think that the thing I'd say to myself is just do you because it's going to happen. Love that. That's also great advice to the audience out there tuning in. Mm -hmm. And Robin, on behalf of the sag After Foundation, thank you so much for sharing your experience, your process and craft with your fellow performers today. And thank you so much for joining us. My absolute pleasure, Jazz. All the best. Abundant blessings to you all and happy holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs>